long before regenerative agriculture became a buzzword. Come on, girl. And before the era of social media. <laughs> Four remarkable individuals forged a path less traveled in the world of ranching. If you've got it, you've got it. If you ain't got it, you ain't never going to have it. Their keen observation of their land and critical thinking led them to foresee the need for change in the cattle market. It all goes back to nature. With the aim of preserving the land for future generations and safeguarding their livelihoods, these pioneers paved the way for regenerative ranching in Louisiana. All of this regenerative agriculture can be done once you get the microbes in that soil functioning. That's why we're calling them legends. Nestled amidst the pines of Norwood, Louisiana, for generations, Wedge and his brother Sammy have lived out their dream of ranching. I've wanted to be on this place since I was 10 years old. Just as the land is woven in their souls, Come on, girls. Cliff Vining also stands as a testament to the dedication of a rancher. We started out with conventional cattle operation, and we got to reading and we decided that there had to be a better way. Decades ago, Don and Betty Ashford set out to fulfill their dreams of nurturing cattle on their own land. We had, we had baby calves pretty much pretty quick, didn't we, darling? When I was a kid growing up, and I grew up in town, and most of the kids had pictures of baseball players on the wall, I had pictures of cows. And among these land stewards stands J.A. Gergenti, who found inspiration in all of these men. I would put Wedge up against anybody in the South about Clover. They kind of were my mentors. They held my hand, you know, when I, when I first got introduced. Fueled by a desire for a more sustainable lifestyle, a balanced budget, and nurtured soil, they embarked on a journey towards regenerative ranching. Yeah, when you start walking across the man's pasture and you start seeing manure piles with all the little dung beetle activity going on, you know he's doing something right. Their innovation extended beyond the norm. They embraced change by using electric fencing instead of bob wire, implementing water systems, and practicing rotational grazing. Well, anytime you can go out there and dig you up, up, up a bait of fishing worms, Anywhere you want to, there's something to be said about it. With conviction, they firmly believed that economic success depended on reducing cost by practicing rotational grazing. To be sustainable, you have to practice soil health, you have to practice management. Management is the name of the game. Before that, we were taking the grass down to the roots and it would take 60 or 70 days before we could come back. I was brought up under the idea that do the best you can do with the, what you've got at the time. Their quest for knowledge took various forms. I've had 65, I think, probably. From reading to attending workshops. This is what got me started when I was a kid. That book right there. Wedge, is, he's been to more seminars and on the subject of what we're doing than anybody that I know of. But their journey wasn't without challenges. God, yeah, shoot. Everybody thought I'd lost my mind. Many called them crazy for stepping away from the norm. You, you got this reservation, and in that, on that reservation, they want to put everything in a box. Well, the minute you jump out of that box, they go to white eye on you. I've been off reservations so long, that don't make me no never mind. <laughs> Yet these visionaries stood firm, knowing that their commitment would eventually bear fruit. It's mostly been poo-pooed on by most people that you tell it to. Their reasons for choosing this unconventional path were clear. It's basically, do you want to make a profit or do you not want to make a profit? The pursuit of profit without compromise and a commitment to leaving their land healthier for future generations. Like I told you a while ago, those four heavens out there, that's for great grandsons. That'll be the fourth generation of this family that own cattle. By adopting regenerative principles, learn by working with nature. They were able to cut expenses, boost organic matter in their soil, and rejuvenate their ranches. Don used to say, pulse that grass, you know, keep it working all the time and, and take half and leave half. You know, believe in what you're doing. And Another thing about this that most people don't understand, 
If this whole place was wide open and this number of cows on it, the manure concentration wouldn't be what it is now. We've got 35 paddocks on this farm here, and they're essentially all in 10 acre blocks, but we've got 36 water troughs. Regenerative agriculture, as championed by these men, isn't just a method, it's a philosophy, a commitment to restoring the land's vitality, fostering a delicate balance that benefits both the rancher and the environment. We don't feed no supplement to the cow herd. If you can't make a cow in, 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 in Louisiana make it through the summer on, on winter on hay, you need to look at your program because it ain't worth a crap. Through sustainable practices, regenerative agriculture replenishes soil health and enhances biodiversity, leaving a positive mark on the land. We gotta start thinking and measuring success or failure in farming and profit per acre, especially in livestock. If I know how much grass is out here, I know how many cattle I can put out here for a 24 hour day. Everything we do is based on a day. That's wheat, that's ball clover, that's a rye grass. You see these little sticker bushes right here? Those grow in Louisiana S1 clover. We used to run barefoot on a track that was, and they hurt, right? It's so fascinating when you get into it and you begin to understand where you can go with it. This place didn't have an earthworm on it until the last 15 years. We've been in this almost 40 years. This didn't, didn't happen. I mean, it, it took, it took a lot of work and worry to get this here. And it can all leave in a matter of minutes if you do it wrong again. United by a shared vision, they founded the Louisiana Grazing Lands Coalition. Here they formed a community of like-minded land stewards, sharing insights from their unique pieces of land. Southeast Grazers will host a pasture meeting and pasture walk on Saturday, October 1st, 2011. Put your lawn chair in the truck, invite somebody to come with you who may be interested in grazing management and livestock production and join us. Now this was the first, this was the list. And you see, this is a note he wrote me back. I do, I mean, we wasn't trying to impress people or be famous or anything like that because Lord knows we needed one. But we thought it was a good idea and we thought it was something that we could help other people with. We always had coffee, made cookies, did those kinds of things, and then I was in the pasture with them and I took the pictures. This coalition has become a beacon of knowledge, providing education and guidance to those who seek to embrace regenerative agriculture. There were a few things that I took from other places and brought here, and I hope some of them took things from here and down there to their places and incorporated. You only have control over how much money you spend. You don't have any control over the weather. You don't have any control over the price. You don't have any control of any of that. And the biggest thing is training the man to open his mind and change his mindset on things. Their mission was clear to educate others about the practices that ignited their passion, practices they were integrating into their own ranching operations. People, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. I can manage as many cattle as I want to put on a place by myself. I don't have to have 40 cowboys riding horses. And as my son says, there ain't no work here. All you do is ride around and move cattle. I said, right. Today, the tables have turned. What once was considered radical is now sought after, as more people recognize the wisdom in their ways. It's got a lot to do with the market. When the market is down, they don't think they're getting enough money for their cattle, and they understand they have to do something different. Then maybe managed grazing is a good idea. Even now, in their 70s and beyond, they continue to share their wisdom, their passion, and their stories. That, that, would, that would be a major flaw in my DNA, that I am totally unconventional. It allowed me to be innovative and do what I thought was right. If you got to go make a paycheck to take care of your cow, ain't no way in hell. So you got to get to the point. You can still have a job, but this is separate. If this is feeding itself without this, 
there's a chance you might make some money one day. But as long as you're taking money out of here and putting it over here, you can do your income tax any way you want to. It's either success or failure based on nature, but you got to work with nature. You can't be antagonistic or try to buck nature's trends. You've got to live with it and work with it. I promise the good Lord I didn't think this land was was meant to be plowed, and if you'd be with me, there would never be another plow roll across this ground. And as long as I'm here, there ain't gonna be no plow roll across. For Don, Cliff, J.A., and Wedge, raising cattle isn't just a livelihood. It's a lifeline, a purpose that keeps them alive and thriving. There ain't very many people can walk through, uh, get to this stage of their life and say that, you know, I've had a pretty good journey. My occupation was my hobby. So what you gonna complain about? My occupation was my hobby.